this week we'll be covering the first part of the project where the telescope is initially designed and built. Next week we'll look at the electronics and software and using the completed rig to try and take some pictures as well as some of the other interesting applications. Yeah, about that. You'd think after well over a hundred videos and countless projects I'd have learned by now. For the record, if you ever hear me say, this'll be easy, it'll be done in no time, uh, assume I'm wrong? At first I added the face because I wanted that shot, but honestly it came to embody the days we spent making this work. If you didn't watch last week's video, here's the short version, but I'd really suggest you watch that one first. The goal of this project is twofold. The first part is to design and build a radio telescope that is scalable so that future iterations will be able to do neat tricks like pulling data from faraway satellites and taking radio images of the sky or detecting distant objects. The second is to use the prototype to take images of various terrestrial frequencies, starting with frequencies in the Wi-Fi range. In theory, this should mean seeing where Wi-Fi sources are in a building. Last week, we built the main structure, cut the gears, and started working at the kinks to get the thing moving. We also did initial assembly of the antenna, and I ended off the episode with one motor being wired up and the armature moving in nice, smooth arcs. Uh, for the most part. This week, the plan was to quickly get the lower motor working so that we could turn the assembly and then hop into GNU Radio to start collecting data. And then it was supposed to just be a quick hop, skip, and jump to taking images. Wow, did that not go as planned. Right off the bat, making the lower assembly work has been a process in and of itself. You may recall that in the first episode I showed my original plan for this rig. Notice the gearing at the bottom. If you watched last week's episode, you'll know that we decided to leave it out, thinking that our steppers had enough power to just turn everything. This couldn't have been farther from the truth, and we ran into a bunch of issues very quickly. Problem one was the four-wire stepper replacement that I was going to be installing here was much taller than the original eight-wire stepper that was initially mounted here. Problem two was that I wanted to remove the wobble that many of you pointed out last time. This turned into a total rebuild of the lower assembly. At first I just cut out a base plate for the upper assembly to sit on. This addressed the wobble, but added a ton of friction. We also found out the hard way that no matter what sort of adhesive we used, nothing could deal with the sheer amount of torque being applied here, and couldn't bond the stepper axle to the upper assembly without breaking after minimal use. The nice thing about working in a hackerspace is that you never really know what's lying around. We got lucky and found some gears that had been printed out ages ago for another project and just happened to be the perfect fit. So to deal with the height issues and the torque issues, we rebuilt the lower box, this time out of some particle boards since I didn't feel like squishing PVC for another three hours. This time, the sides were cut 8 centimeters tall to accommodate the taller stepper, and leave lots of room for the rest of the mechanism without having to squeeze things in. Rather than driving the platform directly, we switched back to the original design, so a small gear was fitted onto the stepper and a larger gear was fit onto a piece of wooden dowel. To make sure everything held in place and ran true without wobble, we cut a pair of Teflon bearings and a small wooden plate for the bottom with a recess the dowel could turn in with minimal friction. The base plate I'd cut earlier had its center hole enlarged to fit the dowel and bearing. Then after a lot of adjustment to the depthing, we found a place where everything ran nicely so the pieces were glued and press fit into place. To help limit friction from the upper assembly rubbing on the platform, we glued some washers to the corners and added some captain tape on top of everything to make sure it was as smooth as possible. At first we relied on our initial strategy of using adhesive to bond the new drive shaft to the upper platform, by first enlarging the hole and connecting it with a little bit of hot glue. But after a minute's worth of us driving it around, the adhesive came loose again. Even though we'd hoped that the larger surface area would have more contact so it would hold better, it turned out not to be the case, and there was still far too much torque. At this point I was getting pretty sick of having to redo this, so I decided to just fix this by cutting a slot in both the dowel and the upper assembly, which a metal shim could be fit into. This way the force is directly translated to the upper assembly and no adhesive was being stressed. Any glue used would just be to hold this shim in place. This turned out to be a great idea but came with one huge flaw. Wood is weak. So after cutting the grooves, making the shim, and reassembling everything for what felt like the 10,000th time, and driving it around a little bit, the wood couldn't take the stress in the area where I'd cut the groove snapped. Much like my patience. After taking everything apart again, we decided to get more serious. No more brakes, no more stupidity, no more having to redo this. We rebuilt the drive shaft, but this time out of an aluminum rod and a fresh gear. After some more adjustment, taking things apart, putting them back together again, doing that 12 more times, and gluing things together with enough epoxy to resist the heat death of the universe, and refitting the shim, we were able to finally drive the robot and get it rotating properly. No more slippage, and barely any slop in the mechanism. And then we tried raising the armature. Guess who'd cut the aluminum rod too tall? After 20 more minutes of filing to stop the back end of the armature colliding, things were back to running smoothly. It was also at this point that we realized that if we were going to be taking a picture of a building, we're probably never going to need to tip it this high anyway, but it's nice to know it's got the functionality if we need it. With all that sorted, we could finally try sending the robot commands and have it trace a path rather than driving it manually like we did last week. We spent a while fine-tuning everything and figuring out how many steps in each direction we wanted it to take for our first images. 
and with that we could finally get to the radio part of this project. We knew we wanted to use GNU Radio since it's an awesome tool set for any custom radio project. However, that versatility is also a pain when you have no idea what you're doing and essentially infinite combinations of blocks and parts to choose from. One of the biggest issues was that at first I was trying to design this to look at a chunk of spectrum to try and pick apart which Wi-Fi router was broadcasting on which channel so that I could see that in the final image. Problem is, I made the mistake of forgetting that frequency hopping is a thing since I've gotten so accustomed to typical radio transmissions that pick a frequency and stick to it. So that idea got tossed along with several hours of work and research when I realized I was being dumb. If all Wi-Fi routers hop through the same frequencies many times per second, then it shouldn't matter which part of the Wi-Fi band we look at, all routers would be represented over time. So we switched to just looking at a single frequency and measuring the power of the received signal. Since we didn't have the luxury of the satellite finder this time, we used GNU Radio to build a power meter thanks to some tutorials and examples we found online and that I've linked in the description. Before packing up and heading home on the last night we were working on this, we did two sample runs. The first, just to make sure that it could actually do a complete pass, and then the second, where the robot is running and data is being collected. Then we went home to get some much needed sleep. As I got to editing this video, I awaited results from Paul to see if he could turn the 850 megabytes of data we'd collected into the 40 by 100 pixel image we were likely to create. But at the time of this video, we're still refining the data flow and working out the kinks. I wanted to wait until we'd sorted it out so I had something more to show this week, but as these things go, sometimes it's just out of your control, as these are hard problems. What we did notice, though, was that there was a distinct line of sorts in the data. Let me show you what I mean. This clip was one that I took just for the sake of an Instagram post, but turned out to be really lucky. In the background, you can see the histogram plot of the signal. Right as the antenna ends up basically parallel, the plot goes crazy, but when pointing up or down, it's pretty quiet. It's not much, but by next week we'll have worked these last few kinks out, and I'm excited to show off all the images we take. So for now, that's where this project is. As is well known by anyone who makes things, the last 20% of any project is what eats 80% of the time spent on it. In the next part of this series, we'll finish the prototype and hopefully have some actual Wi-Fi images to look at that are more interesting than random noise. If we can't get this working with Wi-Fi, I've got some other frequency emitter sources we'll try to see if we can actually localize a signal to a specific location. Next time, we'll also take some time to go through the programming that makes the robot move, the GNU radio script that collects and processes the data, and the Jupyter Notebook script used to convert it all into pretty pictures. Before I close out, I wanted to address some comments from last week's video, as many of you had lots of suggestions for things that we could improve or change. First, why don't you try Arduino was asked by a lot of you. To that, I'd like to point out that the 3D printer board we're using is based on an Arduino Atmega 2560 chipset, so we are using Arduino. Also, we're using the BCNC software, which Paul feeds custom G-code from a script he wrote to control the motion of the robot. Basically, it's just a script that tells the robot to go all the way up, take a step over, go all the way down, and repeat. Next, for those of you wondering why steppers rather than servos. First, we had steppers, and we're very much just using what we had readily available. Second, the point of this project is to develop a system that is long-term useful. Steppers are easier to get in larger and larger sizes, and also provide lots of fine-gained control with the right gearing. And once we'd sorted this out, we could use the same project and board for any other robots we felt like making, or even custom 3D printers which we're looking into. To the, you should just get a insert exotic tool here crowd, again, the point was to use what we had. I'd love a laser cutter, but don't have the cash to throw at one at the moment. Besides, we do have a CNC machine, but just couldn't get it working in time, or rather, decided to spend our time making this robot work, rather than that one. Don't fret though, as we've almost worked the kinks out of that one too, so you'll be seeing it plenty in the future. Finally, to those worried about slop in the mechanism and lack of precision, as some pointed out, an 8-turn helical antenna has a pretty wide beam. So, a degree or two of slop won't make a difference in the final image. In future iterations, this will be tightened way down since we'll be using much more directional antennas where it'll really matter. And with that, it's finally time to wrap up this video. If you've enjoyed and want to see more, be sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and most importantly, ring that bell to see when I post these weekly videos. As always, be sure to leave me a comment with what other projects I should try in the future, and of course, all links to everything that I've talked about is in the description below. As always, these videos are made possible by the support of my amazing patrons, so special thanks to them, and if you'd like to support the show, consider becoming a patron, or maybe check out my store on Redbubble. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.